So we are going to start with um, the 2023 Bob Brower Scientific Symposium, The Effects of Climate Change on Owasco Lake. I'd like to ask up Mark Lowry with the DEC as he presents climate change impacts in New York, New York State, rising to the challenge. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Ann. And thank you to the Association for the Invitation to come out and speak today. Um, a few several weeks ago, my boss asked me if I you okay here? Did I just turn it off? My boss asked me if I was available to come um, speak to the Owasco um, Watershed Lake Association. I said, I wouldn't know Owasco Lake if I fell in it. What am I supposed to say? Um, and she said, your job is not to talk about the lake. Your job is to talk about climate change um, and New York State programs to address it, uh, to set the stage for the much more learned uh, speakers who will come after you. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. Um, talk just a little bit about uh, the global climate change from the global perspective uh, and taking it down to the local perspective and then back out to the global, if you will, but talking about how we in New York State are among the leaders, uh, not only nationally, but internationally in addressing this crisis. As many of you are probably aware, the concentration of of carbon dioxide <clears throat> which is, you know, there is the principal greenhouse gas, started to increase in our atmosphere about the time of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, con uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide rose from about 280 parts per million in, seven, in the late 1700s to the current level of about 414 parts per million. And carbon dioxide concentrations are now higher than at any time in the past 800,000 years as the result of combustion of fossil fuels and land use change. And in particular, that latter category of land use change includes clearing of tropical forests. As a result, we have warmed the planet on which we live by about 1.2 degrees centigrade since before the Industrial Revolution. And we are now well on our way to crossing one, the one and a half and even the 2.0 uh, degrees uh, centigrade threshold scientists tell us we should avoid. The nations of the world have made commitments uh, to uh, uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to keep uh, uh, warming to less than one and a half degrees centigrade, uh, although we, many observers believe we are already past that threshold, um, and we uh, the commitment has been to at least keep uh, warming to less than two degrees centigrade, but that two degrees centigrade uh, threshold is based on fairly old science, as I'll talk about in a few moments. But more importantly, the current policies and, um, and pledges in place, international would not keep uh, warming to less than two degree uh, two degrees centigrade, let alone one and a half degrees centigrade, but are more likely to allow warming to about 2.7 degrees centigrade. Now, I will say that this chart looks a little bit different than it did a year or so ago. It's a little more optimistic because of policies that are increasingly being put in place to give us a little more optimism, but we still um, cannot be optimistic uh, based on, again, current policies of keeping warming below uh, a, a, a dangerous thresholds. So reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is critical for the long fit long-term benefit of our children uh, and grandchildren, but we also must recognize that we will be dealing with substantial climate change and its effects, regardless of what we do now to reduce emissions. Therefore, we are going to have to make investments to reduce our emissions at the same time as we are spending more and more of our resources in to uh, adapting to the effects of climate change. We have already delayed meaningful action so long, for, uh, for far too long, and the longer we procrastinate, the more we will feel the effects of a rapidly warming climate, and the more expensive, the more draconian, and the more likely to fail the necessary greenhouse gas mitigation measures will be. Even one degree warming, and um, a threshold we have already passed, has led to catastrophic effects. 
Global surface temperatures are reaching levels that, ha that have not been seen in the last 100,000 years, and the rate of warming since 1970 has been higher than during any 50-year period in the last two millennia. But so what? We're still only talking about average increases um, uh, in average temperature of just a few degrees, one degree, two degrees. You might say, and you would be right, that we see that much local temperature variation virtually every day, usually over the course of just a few hours. And that's all true, but when we consider the enormity of the global system, including the atmosphere, oceans, and terra firma, a one degree increase in the average temperature represents an enormous increase in the amount of energy in that Earth-ocean system. And that extra energy can drive extremes in both temperature and in the hydrologic cycle. It's a basic physical fact that warmer air holds more moisture about seven degrees centigrade more moisture for every degree centigrade warming. So any precipitation event that occurs is more likely to drop a larger volume of water at a faster rate than it would otherwise. Witness the tragic effects of Hurricane Ida in New York and New Jersey just last year, and your own experience here in the Finger Lakes region with flooding. Although two degrees centigrade has often been presented as a, quote, safe level of warming, in fact, more recently, scientists estimate that at two degrees centigrade, we have only a 50-50 chance of avoiding dangerous feedback, positive feedback loops. Positive feedback loop that simply refers to a phenomenon in which the more we, uh, more one uh, effect occurs, the more its consequences occur and they feed back on one another. An example uh, would be methane from a defrosting tundra. As you probably know, methane is a very powerful um, greenhouse gas. The more the earth system warms, the more per permafrost begins to uh, warm and release more methane. That's more methane in the atmosphere causing more more warming, a vicious cycle. Such feedback loops could push the climate past certain tipping points. Past these tipping points, warming effects could accelerate and create runaway climate change that we would have no hope of reversing and could lead to catastrophe for human civilization. Some scientists believe that we have already crossed some of these critical uh, climate tipping points, including melting of Arctic sea ice and of the Greenland ice sheet melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet, and changes in the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation, which includes the Gulf Stream and will have effect on continental temperatures as well as sea levels. Most scientists also believe that at two degrees centigrade warming, we will begin to see wholesale destruction of some of our most vital ecosystems. Critical ecosystems of particular risk include ocean ecosystems like coral reefs. Other effects at two degrees centigrade will include more frequent European heat waves um, and more lethal heat waves, I should say, and continued acidification of the ocean as higher atmospheric CO2 concentrations force um, uh, uh, more of that CO2 into solution in the oceans. That half a degree will make a big difference to our children and our grandchildren. The additional ice melt associated with two degrees centigrade over one and a half degrees centigrade will cause sufficient sea level rise to displace an additional 10 million people and lead to about $1.4 trillion in damage every year by 2100. Two degrees centigrade will lead to substantially more disease and further jeopardize our ability to feed the nine and a half billion people um, that will be here um, by the end of the century, raising the specter of mass starvation and international destabilization. Further between one and a half and two degrees centigrade, an additional 1.7 billion people will be exposed to severe heat waves and 65 million more will be exposed to deadly heat conditions. Certain parts of the world, including the Southwest United States, could well reach um, uh, circumstances where people will not be able to work outside for any appreciable amount of time without uh, literally dying. Of course, New Yorkers have always faced numerous climate-related hazards, uh, but besides sea level rise, and if you think you don't have to worry about sea level rise here, think about what the state is going to have to pay to adapt to sea level rise. It will, if it hits you nowhere else, it will hit you in the pay pocketbook. But we are also focused on higher average temperatures and precipitation, including more frequent and severe heat waves and greater probability of floods and more frequent summer droughts. These effects will increase the threats to New Yorkers' health and well-being in many ways, including through decreased air quality and diseases transmitted by insects, food, and water. 
Our infrastructure will be increasingly compromised by climate-related hazards, including sea level rise, coastal flooding, and intense precipitation events. And again, our critical ecosystems, fisheries, and agriculture will be increasingly threatened over the next century by a variety of climate change effects. Annual um, precipitation amounts in New York State are projected to increase by about 10 to 20 percent over the course of this century, and an increase in water supplies will likely prove beneficial uh, in attracting residents and, and businesses to New York State as the risk of hot droughts increases in much of the rest of the nation. However, a generally wetter New York carries some risk that we will have to manage. We, can, we generally think of flooding in the context of extreme precipitation events, but bouts of steady rain can overwhelm stormwater systems in urban areas, raise turbidity in water supplies, and cause flooding in overwhelmed wastewater treatment plants resulting in combined sewer overflows. Additional water, if, not proper, if properly managed, may allow expansion of agriculture into some areas, but it also carries risk to farmers. We have had several instances in New York State where prolonged spring rains have caused costly delays in spring planting, or heavy rains have caused loss of crops in the fall, so that those crops, when, once flooded, cannot be sold. Unfortunately, we have seen a dramatic shift in the distribution of, of our precipitation, not just in the volume, but in the, in the distribution of, uh, uh, of the way we get it, with a very high proportion of our annual precipitation coming as extreme storm events, which increasingly lead to flooding. This is, um, of course, I'm not going to uh, complete. I'm not going to read this slide to you. Uh, we all know well the damage and displacement of businesses and individuals that can come with flooding, but flooding can also result in widespread pollution when wastewater treatment plants or other contaminated areas are flooded, um, or when so toxic circumstances from contaminated soils are dispersed by flood water. And it also has effect on our businesses. FEMA estimates that at least 25% of the businesses that close due to a disaster, most frequently a flood, never reopen. We also expect to see um, uh, an increasing trend of uh, increasing annual temperatures, um, but that trend in average uh, temperature will be accompanied by a shift in the frequency and severity of extreme events. That is, we will have hotter, more frequent, and longer heat waves. Uh, if I if I recall the figure correctly, we where we expect to have less than one, uh, the, the chances are we have having less than one heat wave in this region per year. Um, by the end of the century, we can expect to have, I believe it's four to six heat waves uh, in this region um, every year. Of course, heat waves increase demand for air conditioning and water while enhancing risk in our agriculture, energy and transportation sectors in particular. And although we talk about the fact that we're going to have more rain, those rain that those rainy seasons will likely be separated by more frequent summer term time drought. We do not expect to see multi um, decadal uh, mega droughts like they're seeing in the Southwest, um, but we do expect to see uh, again um, more frequent summer short term droughts. Those are droughts that occur um, on uh, 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 for the last about a month or two, and of course those droughts will exacerbate heat waves and uh, generally higher temperatures. These extreme heat effects on the ag and natural ecosystems will be particularly severe during periods of drought. Um, and obviously, droughts have dramatic effects on water supplies and could create competition for water among residential, industrial, ecological, and agricultural needs. In response to the trend of increasing losses due to floods, and in particular, the damage and death that was caused by uh, storm the tropical storm Lee and hurricanes Irene and Sandy, New York State enacted the Community Risk and Resiliency Act back in 2014. This act required, among other things, that applicants for uh, permits for major projects, and I won't get into all the legal um, mumbo jumbo what all that means, um, but um, it required that when DEC issues a major permit, the applicants um, consider um, uh, demonstrate that they had considered future, future physical risk due to sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding in their project design. 
later in 2019, as I'll talk about in a little in a few, more in a few moments, the state enacted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And that primary focus of that act is to address New York State's greenhouse gas emissions, but it had a couple other important sections which amended this the uh, 2014 Community Risk and Resiliency Act so that now applicants for permits for almost all major projects are required to demonstrate consideration of any climate relevant climate hazard not just flooding or sea level rise. Uh, and the law now for the first time uh, gave DEC explicit authority to require mitigation of those climate hazards. DEC's first major activity under the Community Risk and Resiliency Act was to develop guidance on how staff and applicants should um, demonstrate that they were considering future flood risk uh, for use in DEC permit review and optional use in local planning and permitting. And we have produced some guidance that uh, even though municipalities are not required to as part of our Climate Smart Communities Program, we provide guidance on how municipalities can incorporate the same um, uh, forward-looking projections in uh, and regulations into their local zoning. And DEC has begun incorporating this guidance into permit programs and associated guidance, um, some of which may seem um, rather obscure, you know, the general permit for stream activities. What does that mean? Well, that's this general permit um, under which DEC regulates installation uh, and replacement of municipal culverts and, and bridges, um, which often lead to fun, uh, flooding, obviously, if they're undersized. Um, our special permit for uh, concentrated animal feeding operations. These um, the, these permit programs are now incorporating that uh, guidance that requires them uh, to incorporate future conditions uh, into the decision making and design of the program. And of course, we have a lot of ongoing projects. Um, it takes a long time to develop new regulations and new guidance, but ongoing um, projects include development of additional guidance for regulatory review of bridges and bridge and culvert installations that considers, again, future climate conditions and other tools to improve our ability to better communicate um, the risk of flooding uh, and of drought um, to both constituents and decision makers. I'm going to shift gears a bit here. You'll see there's a different color slide because the state has different branding rules for different types of projects. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit not about flooding, but about extreme heat. Again, I mentioned that we expect temperatures to get, it's going to get hotter. Uh, that's the easiest climate parameter to project. Uh, and we will see more heat waves. Um, urban residents are, in particular, are vulnerable to ex heat extremes due to the extreme uh, urban heat island effect. Um, where the um, uh, blacktop and concrete and so forth tend to hold heat and where there tends to be less, less shade uh, to provide heat. So in her 2022 <clears throat> State of the State ad address, um, Governor Hochul directed DEC and NYSERDA to develop an extreme heat action plan, uh, which we are doing now, uh, taking up a huge amount of our time uh, and resources, uh, but we think it's very important work uh, because of the vulnerability of, of residents of the state. Um, the planning will include development of maps of urban heat islands in urban disadvantaged communities, uh, development of a heat-specific annex to the state comprehensive emergency management plan, and, and all also a long-term heat adaptation plan that will prioritize where possible use of green infrastructure to reduce risk associated with extreme heat. This process will include, uh, I should say does include, because it is ongoing, a very robust stakeholder process. And I won't um, go through all of that um, the details of that process, um, but if you have an interest in participating, there are numerous options, um, and depending on your interest and amount of time you want to want to spend in this process. If you're interested in participating in the extreme heat uh, planning process, um, you can uh, contact my office or refer to the URL down there at the bottom of this slide. Also, as you know, the voters um, back in November approved the $4.2 billion Clean Water, Clean Air, and Clean Jobs Environmental Bond Act. Uh, we are currently uh, at the state level um, working to identify important projects that we will uh, fund with this um, with this funding. Governor Hochul has directed an interagency working group to begin identifying needs for environmental funding across the state. 
Uh, we'll be developing the program guidance and the, and, the very, and the criteria that always come with state funding programs. And we expect to launch within the next several uh, weeks, I believe, a statewide uh, listening tour to engage with communities. So uh, if you have an interest in how that $4.2 billion uh, will be spent, uh, much of which is directed toward improving water quality and reducing flood risk, uh, watch for announcements of those opportunities. When I talk to my colleagues in other states, um, they salivate um, at the prospect of having that much funding available uh, to address some of the critical infrastructure needs we have. So look, going back now to the global perspective, um, as you might have heard, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently issued its, first, its sixth assessment report. The IPCC issues these reports about every five or six years, and they're based on the best uh, critical reviews of the best available science. And the conclusions of the most recent report were so stark and the evidence for the damaging effects of continued fossil fuel combustion so strong that the Secretary General of the UN was prompted to call for immediate global action to reduce and eventually eliminate use of fossil fuels which leads me to New York State's sweeping program to reduce its own emissions. New York State enacted in July of 2019, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, that law went into effect on January 1st of 2020. The statute set achievement of a net zero economy by 2050 as a goal requiring an 85% reduction in the state's greenhouse gas emissions. And when I say the state, I don't mean state agencies, I mean the entire state economy. Um, and, um, and, and it sets an interim limit of 40% uh, uh, it requires, um, I'm sorry, it has an, an in, interim requirement uh, requiring a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Although the Climate Act did not de detail an, an emissions reduction plan, it envisioned an overall strategy of beneficial electrification of the entire state economy, empowering that efficient electrified economy with clean sources of power. The law made a Climate Action Council, uh, a 22-member uh, appointed council responsible for developing the scoping plan. The scoping plan, in turn, was to guide DEC and other agencies in developing the implementing regulations. Um, the, the council started its work in early 2020, um, released a draft scoping plan at the end of 2021. Uh, uh, through the first part of 2022, we held the council held 11 public hearings uh, in person, two online hearings, and took in over 35,000 public comments. Uh, folks like me then spent the next, the latter half of 2022, um, in reviewing those comments and incorporating them uh, to so that the council could release its final scoping plan um, at the end of 2022. The agencies are currently working on implementation of those scoping plan recommendations, um, and earlier this year, the governor gave her state of the state address, and in that address, um, climate action played a prominent role. Um, an important piece of the governor's agenda uh, is ensuring energy affordability and energy efficiency in buildings. On the affordability front, the governor has proposed providing a credit to 800,000 um, households with un incomes under $75,000 to help them pay for their electric bills. Um, and because 30% of the state's greenhouse gas, gas emissions come from our buildings, the governor has proposed requiring zero emissions in new building construction for residential and low-rise multifamily buildings by 2025 and by 2028 for commercial and larger buildings. She has also proposed, and these proposals are all consistent and derived from recommendations that were in that final scoping plan. She has proposed that the sale and installation of fossil fuel space and water heating equipment be phased out starting in 2030 uh, for equipment size for residential applications and continuing in 2035 for equipment size for commercial applications. That does not mean that someone's coming to confiscate your gas stove. Um, it also, there is no proposal to ban wood burning, um, as some of the fear mongering has claimed. 
the scoping plan recommended and the governor rec uh, embraced in her executive budget an economy-wide cap and invest program to cap emissions and invest proceeds in emissions reduction programs and funding for economically vulnerable New Yorkers. DEC and NYSERDA will soon announce opportunities for stakeholders to provide input as these agencies design a program that will set an annual cap on the amount of greenhouse gas pollution that is permitted to be um, uh, emitted in New York State. Every year, that pollution cap will be lowered to meet our greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. Large-scale greenhouse gas emitters and distributors of heating and transportation fuels would be required to purchase allowances. For those of you who are familiar with um, other uh, cap-and-trade programs uh, or a program like the Regional Greenhouse Gas uh, Initiative, which is, applies to power plants in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states, this is a similar uh, approach. Uh, the cap and invest pro and program would incentivize businesses and other entities tra to transition to low carbon alternatives as a cost saving measure to them. Proceeds from the sale of the allowances these emitters would be required to purchase would support the state's investments in climate mitigation, energy efficiency, clean transportation, and other projects, in addition to delivering money back to New Yorkers in the form of a rebate. As we developed a scoping plan, we realized, and, and I would mention that I was uh, an appointed member to the Climate Action Council's local um, uh, land use and local government advisory panel. So we were very much attuned to what local governments uh, are doing uh, and recognize that um, local actions would be critical to meeting the state's emission reduction requirements, while at the same time they are preparing for the effects of climate change. Unfortunately, we already had a robust program to support local climate action in the Interagency Climate Smart Communities Program. Um, there are now uh, eight agencies. This is not a DEC program. It's actually an eight agency interagency program that provides um, funding, free technical assistance in the form of uh, essentially on the ground uh, coordinators that our office funds, contractors uh, that can provide boots on the ground technical assistance to municipal uh, municip municipalities. <clears throat> we also provide grants and uh, to support installation of charging infrastructure and purchase or lease of electric vehicles. There are currently 374 registered climate smart communities in the state. In 2016, we um, launched the, I'm sorry, 2014, 14, we launched the uh, Climate Smart Community Certification Program. Um, I believe we have one, um, we have a couple certified municipalities uh, in the watershed uh, in the area. Um, and so uh, I, what I would um, encourage you to do, if you are interested in how your municipality can take action, um, I would encourage you to contact your municipal leaders and um, offer your support and if necessary, cajole them uh, into participating in the program. Um, it is a completely voluntary program. There are no legal requirements. Um, but we believe it provides a foundation uh, to which to plan and base your local cl uh, climate action. As I wrap up, I'd like to bring us back to the global perspective uh, with which I started. Again, despite decades of warning, we continue to emit greenhouse gases at an alarming pace. Maintaining a livable planet will require us to end our addiction to fossil fuels. The sooner the better. And doing so will require uh, commitment to implement large-scale changes, but these changes will have enormous benefits in terms of job production and protection of public health in particular. <clears throat> and I'll just close by addressing what is often the very first question I get at a presentation like this, which is why should New York State or the United States reduce its emissions? Why doesn't China or, in, or, or India reduce theirs? And for me, at least, the reason is one of fairness and responsibility toward others with whom we share the planet. <clears throat> Excuse me. U.S. per capita emissions are they're not the largest in the world, but they are much larger than those of either China or India, and many times larger than the per capita emissions of those who will suffer the worst effects of climate change. We have led in polluting the atmosphere with our greenhouse gases. We must now lead in cleaning it up. Thank you.
Sorry, I was not trying to beat a hasty retreat before the questions. Thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. Uh, we've got a couple of really interesting questions coming in online. And um, uh, Carol and maybe Ken are going to answer questions, or hand mics out, answer questions in house here. Um, one of these questions. Okay. Will there be more influx for support of gray water systems in government, industrial, commercial, and residential facilities to help offset drought and heat islands? I do not have a specific answer to that. What I would suggest that if the questioner believes that would be an appropriate use, for instance, uh, in some of the water quality bond act funding, that might be a comment that they provide during the public input opportunities. Thank you. The slide on the uh, goals that the state has set for meeting the greenhouse gas targets uh, was interesting. There was, and it was really packed with information. I, I didn't catch all of it, but I, I saw that it that the um, Climate Change Reduction Act had goals for uh, adding in um, renewable energy sources for electricity uh, in the in the coming years. Right. Um, I don't think it mentioned anything about how the uh, growth and demand for electricity uh, projections looked, but everything I've read suggests that there's going to be an exponentially large uh, growth in in electricity demand. Right. Do the numbers add up? Uh, are the targets going to be large enough to to meet the projected increases in demand the, for electricity? The, what, what the people who do the modeling, and I'm not one of those, tell me is that their modeling adds up. The, the required, we will re have to um, install more renewables than was on that slide to meet the requirements, um, but the the modeling that was done as part of the development of the scoping plan um, and gets into that level of detail, how much more renewables we will need. Um, and, and tried to answer the question, is this even feasible? And I will tell you that the answer that the technical folks came back to the council was, yes, it is technically feasible, but it will be um, um, challenging and we will have to move quickly um, to meet those goals, to meet not only the installation, the renewable installation goals, uh, but we will also have to build more transmission and distribution uh, infrastructure and in fact the public, you know, and, and you know, of course, most people don't see all this work that's being done. Just a few weeks ago, the Public Service Commission um, approved, I believe it is, 62 transmission and distribution projects um, to, to help ensure that as renewables are built, we can get that power to where the load centers are. So that, you know, that single slide that you referred to has a few factoids on it. Those are not there in a vacuum. There's a lot of planning that goes on, uh, and in that case, mostly at NYSERDA and the Department of Public Service and, and the Public Service Commission. Um, but it, I think the answer to your question is, we believe we can do it, but we it's going to take some commitment and some investment. And I didn't notice whether nuclear was on that slide. Is is nuclear the, the, part the, of the equation? So the 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 rule the, the, what the law says is that by twenty. 30, 70% of our electricity that's sold in the state, whether it comes from out of the state or, or is generated within the state, has to come from renewable sources. By 2040, they have to, 100% uh, of the electricity has to come from zero emissions sources. Right now, nuclear is considered zero emissions. Um, and the modeling um, is assumed that the current nuclear fleet would continue operating. Uh, at least I believe to to it was 60 years old. Um, don't hold me to that number, but I believe that was the assumption. It does not assume that there would be new nuclear sited at this point. Thank you, Mark. A um, couple more have come in. Um, questions. We, by the way, we have 72 people online. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, please uh, put your questions in the chat if you have them. Um, one question was pretty much just answered 
by you about the electrical infrastructure and also by uh, Robert Howarth, who I believe is a researcher down at Cornell University. And I can forward these all to everybody later. Some of these are kind of long. Um, and we will also, people are <laughs> asking if we're recording this. Yes, we're recording it. We'll be putting it up on our YouTube site when we're done. Um, I think that we've covered everything. Any other quick questions? Hi, Mark. Senator Rachel May, I represent Hi, Senator. Cuyahoga County in the Senate. Um, I have not seen anybody estimate what the CAP and INVEST program is expected to bring in in terms of revenue. Is that something that you have information the, on? I don't know how precisely that's been modeled. I, the number I have heard discussed is about $10 billion a year. But how, again, I don't have the support for that. I don't, and that's not, I haven't seen the documentation for that. Another question here. Um, uh, any consideration to environmentally effective ways to manage cooling of various cities, quote unquote. For example, trees that might promote more shade and less air conditioning, rainwater for watering plants, gardens, more education to the public on cost-effective ways to reduce the use of fossil fuels. Are they asking me if we have ideas? Was that the it, question? It said any consideration to environmentally effective Ab Absolutely. Ways. That's the whole idea of the heat adaptation plan is to identify um, the best practices uh, and uh, provide guidance on where those um, best practices should be um, put into play. One of the things that we're really looking at is not just um, practices that would address a single building, but entire neighborhoods, looking at how neighborhoods are designed to get better um, crosswinds, if you will, through the neighborhoods. There's uh, a lot of science out there that we, our group will be synthesizing and making available. Wonderful. Um, and a couple of questions are coming in that they'd like to actually speak. And I apologize if you are remote, we're not set up to do that at this time. Um, Another one came in quickly as, as in gets the stage, emphasis on reduction of emissions. There are ways to reverse the effects of global warming, such as regenerative farming versus monocrop agriculture. It's more of a statement, but. Absolutely, and the scoping plan does include. So you, if you recall, um, I pointed out that the, the uh, law require, sets a goal of zero, net zero but requires an 85% reduction in emissions. That leaves 15% to be sequestered. And there are sizable um, chapters in the scoping plan that address sequestration in, in both our forest and our agricultural sectors. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I know that there might have been a few more questions. Just um, those online, we will get to those. Those here within the house, speak to one of us and we'll make certain the question is delivered to the speaker. And I do know locally, the climate um, smart communities, many municipalities are working towards getting that designation, these communities within the watershed, the Owasco Lake watershed. So more to come with that. 